This is good, actually. I was hoping we didn't have to sit there during her whole talk. Great. Yeah, yeah. In and out. Okay. Great. I will. Sure, I keep on top of my All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome to the first campus conversation of the new academic year. Um, like last year, we are continuing with the theme, what's going on and why, and can we imagine a more just future? The goal of the Campus Conversation Series is to have faculty, students, and staff engage, engage with each other about some of the big issues <coughs> of our time that are going on now and affecting all of us. As a community dedicated to social justice and diversity, we come together to try to understand current events and talk about the issues. If we are going to talk about current events, we need to begin each conversation with background, some context, so that we can start to understand at least some of the causes of what we see going on around us. We do this through speakers who can provide this information <coughs> from the point of view of history, economics, law, sociology, and so forth. The second and equally critical part of this campus conversation is the conversation, the sharing of ideas to see if we can indeed imagine a more just future. Last year, the conversation mostly occurred at a separate session, usually one week after the presentation. This year, we are trying something different by having the conversation immediately following the presentation. I encourage you, however, to think of these conversations here today as just the beginning and to continue them in the classroom and with your friends and with your families. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Jane Rhodes, Alexandra Falindra, Jenny Breyer, Teresa Cordova, David Merriman, Sharut Akro, and Aisha El Amin for helping arrange today's conversation with the eminent historian <coughs> Nancy McLean. Dr. McLean will speak for about 25 minutes, and this will be followed by a conversation among Dr. McLean, Dr. Rhodes, and Dr. Falindra for about 20 minutes. After that, we will open up the floor to Q&A, and we will end at 1.30. Paper has been provided to you on your chairs so that you can write down your questions. We will collect these after the talk and utilize them during the Q&A session from around 12.45 to 1.30. Dr. McLean's newest book, about which she will speak today, is available in the White Oak Room next door, and she will be doing a book signing immediately following her talk today. It's now my privilege to introduce Dr. Nancy McLean. Nancy McLean is the William H. Chafee Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University and the immediate past president of the Labor and Working Class History Association. She is the author of Behind the Mask of Chivalry, The Making of the Second Ku Klux Klan, Freedom is Not Enough, The Opening of the American Workplace, and two books for course use, The American Women's Movement, 1945 to 2000, A Brief History <coughs> of Documents, and Debating the American Conservative Movement, 1945 to the Present. Her scholarship has received more than a dozen prizes and awards and has been supported by fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Humanities Center, the Russell Sage Foundation, and the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowships Foundation. Dr. McLean's most recent book about which she will speak today is Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Right Stealth Plan for America. Book List called it, quote, perhaps the best explanation to date of the roots of the political divide that threatens to irrevocably alter American government. And The Guardian said, quote, it's the missing chapter, a key to understanding the politics of the past half century. And I can say myself, it is indeed riveting reading, painstakingly researched, and very well written. And just last week, Democracy in, Change, in Chains was long listed for the National Book Award. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nancy McLean. Thank you. Thank 
you so much, Dean Poser, for that um, generous introduction. And thank you all for coming out uh, today to, uh, to participate in this conversation. Uh, I am delighted to be with you and delighted to see so many students uh, in the audience. But we do have some serious things to talk about here. American politics are in crisis in Washington and in the states. A government that is supposed to be of, by, and for the people is in crisis. Even elementary norms of civic decency and truth are in crisis, and citizens are being attacked now from the White House down. You know this. It has become abundantly clear of late, at least since Charlottesville, to anyone who has been paying, uh, not been paying close attention before. What you may be struggling to figure out, though, is how we got here and what it means. The watershed that we have reached now in our public life has been fed by many streams, some of which have received extensive attention from scholars. These include the kind of movement conservatism that made Barry Goldwater the Republican candidate for president in 1964, just after he had voted against the Civil Rights Act of that year. Another and related stream is the religious right. And there is the white supremacist right, right too, uh, that is I fear too euphemistically referred to today as the alt-right. All of these are important and have produced votes needed to affect radical <coughs> policy change. But I'm here today to tell you about another piece of the puzzle of how we got into the dangerous situation in which we find ourselves. About the ideas that are guiding the billionaire-funded libertarian right made notorious by Charles Koch, the CEO of Koch Industries. And I believe it is the crucial piece that we have missed, because it is the piece that explains so much that until now seemed mysterious. It's also crucial, I believe, because knowing about this piece will, may equip citizens, such as all of you uh, here in this discussion today, to lead the way out of this mess before it is too late. For there's an unmarked peril in our situation now. The noisiest threats are getting the most attention, among them the now chronic race baiting and saber rattling coming from the White House, I regret to say. But as that spectacle has drawn nearly all media and voter attention, an even more perilous uh, plan, I believe, is moving along apace. It is doing so in the uh, 30 states now dominated by this cause, uh, in federal agencies, and in our courts. That plan is being pursued by a much smaller cause, but an arch archly determined and a breathtakingly well-funded cause. And this causes architects aim to change the very operating rules of our society and government permanently. And they have shown themselves quite willing to use these other popular sections of the right and the prejudices that they uh, reflect, the religious right and the white supremacist right in particular, to get what they want. I'll state my case simply. Behind all the seeming chaos and dysfunction in our public <coughs> life right now, there is a strategy in play, a cold-eyed, calculated strategy. And that strategy is far along. One of its field generals said to a secret donor meeting, fortunately somebody got a tape recorder in there, uh, in late 2015, we're close to winning. They, meaning the critics, meaning essentially the rest of us, don't have the real path, end quote. That was Mark Holden, the head of Coke Industries government and public affairs operation, gloating to an invitation-only audience of billionaire and multimillionaire donors. Now, you've probably heard, if you've been uh, uh, paying attention to politics over the last several years, uh, you've probably heard about the fortune that Charles Koch has been investing in our politics and recruiting other donors to do the same. But what you likely have not heard about is the ideas, <coughs> the technology, as Charles Koch chooses to, to refer to them, that have made these investments so devastatingly effective. It was an academic economist, I learned, through my research, who taught Charles Koch that for capitalism of the free reign variety that they both supported to thrive, democracy must be enchained. The book that I'm here to tell you about, Democracy in Chains, provides the unknown backstory 
I believe, of the defining moment in which we find ourselves. And it reveals what Mark Holden called the real path uh, that this cause is taking. In its essence, this book is the story of two men, a CEO and a thinker, uh, whose lives converged through a shared commitment to shackle the model of citizen-driven government that our country built up over the 20th century. The thinker was a Tennessee-born economist, James McGill Buchanan, who spent most of his adult life in Virginia institutions, uh, beginning at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville in 1956. The CEO is the Kansas-backed uh, uh, Charles Koch, who spent most of his adult life when he wasn't building uh, Koch Industries into one of the largest, uh, most profitable corporations in the world. Um, he spent most of his adult life trying to find a way to make our country and the world, in fact, I'll come back to that, conform to his arch vision of economic liberty. A kind of free reign capitalism akin to the 19th century variant skewed by the novelist Charles Dickens. That was the kind of capitalism that brought us the Great Depression and the polarization between fascism and communism after World War I. Koch's vision is an audacious one, in short, and he has actually compared himself to Martin Luther of the Protestant Reformation uh, when he set to, to work in earnest on this project. And he also said, when he was making his first huge investment in Buchanan Center at George Mason, he said, I want to unleash the kind of force that propelled Columbus to his discoveries. I believe these men are playing with fire, that is to say, with our lives and with the kind of society that future generations will inherit. The book my story, uh, the story my book tells is first of the crucible in which Buchanan came up with the idea of enchaining democracy to insulate economic liberty as the civil rights movement was opening up uh, the Virginia in which he was working and the nation as a whole to more inclusive, robust democracy in the late 1950s and 60s. And then the story is about <coughs> Charles Koch funded an apparatus to make that idea a reality in a messianic quest that has produced the horrifying situation we are now confronting uh, in America. It's a frightening story, uh, I acknowledge. Um, several readers have even said that it made them reminded, put them in mind of a Stephen King novel. Now, I've never read one, but I kind of took the point. It is a frightening story. But on the other hand, as a scholar and as a citizen, I believe that understanding what we're really up against is vital to understanding and to, to, um, to, to assessing how best to defend a democracy that many of us now understand is facing truly existential threat. Knowledge can be empowering, uh, and that is what I am hearing back from readers, at least the ones who write to me. The others could be in fetal crouches, I don't know. <laughs> but um, the ones who write to me are saying things like, and here's one from uh, this past week, it feels like the curtain has been pulled back and now we can see what is really uh, going on. But rather than lecture uh, at you in a conventional <coughs> way, I want to share with you the story of how I stumbled on the trail that led me to these uh, conclusions, because it was anything but linear. And knowing the route that led here uh, will help you, I think, to understand the stakes of what I've just said a little more concretely. Um, because the reason I say that is because it turns out that what we're seeing now is not the first time that the libertarian right has shown itself willing to exploit white supremacy to advance its agenda for the political economy. And also because it shows the surprising role that some scholars have played in bringing us to this point, which is a history that I think all of us in educational settings need to reckon with, students, faculty, and administrators. <coughs> so without further ado, here's the story of democracy in chains. I am a historian of the United States, the modern United States. I particularly study social movements with a focus on the, a long-standing interest in the US South. And about 10 years ago, I came across the tragic story of Prince Edward County, Virginia, a county in Southside, Virginia, whose white officials answered the Supreme Court's 1954 call to desegregate its public schools without further delay by, as they put it, the county leaders, quote, going out of the public school business entirely. They shuttered their public school system. 
They even put up no trespassing signs on uh, the, the former public schools. And they left black children with no formal education whatsoever, only what social movement organizations could provide, as their white peers headed off to private segregation academies with state-subsidized uh, tuition grants, what we today might call vouchers. And these Prince Edward County officials persisted in the name of states' rights and individual liberty for five years until the courts finally compelled them to reinstate a school system. Shocked and deeply moved by the system, I started this, this situation, I started to research. And I learned that tax-funded school vouchers were crucial to this story, crucial to the ability of Virginia segregationists uh, to get what they wanted and to fight Brown. And I learned that the University of Chicago economist Milton Friedman had issued his first manifesto for vouchers in 1955 in the full knowledge of how that could be used in the South because Southern segregationist officials had already been saying they would shut down the public schools rather than obey the federal courts. So Friedman became part of my story. But in following a footnote, I learned of a 1959 uh, report. As this Prince Edward County uh, threat to end public schooling was in the air by two other economists who had just set up a new center for political economy and social philosophy, they called it, at Charlottesville in 1956, one of whom was James McGill Buchanan. Their report attempted to uh, refute the moderate whites who were trying to save Virginia's public school system by making a case that if the state sold off its facilities to private operators, it could provide better education. They use language that would be very familiar to us today about combating monopoly and choice and so forth uh, without obeying the courts. Their report, in effect, urged the privatizing of Virginia schools before that verb even existed. And they were doing so after the governor had shut down schools in three districts of Virginia through the entire fall of 1958, locking out 13,000 white students from education uh, to keep them <coughs> from attending desegregated schools. Now, these economists were issuing this report, again, in the full knowledge that the schools thus funded would be white segregation academies because segregationists were the only constituencies clamoring for such private schools. Uh, and uh, they were also, as black leaders pointed out, thus asking for their bigotry to be tax subsidized by other taxpayers, including African American citizens of Virginia who were denied the vote. Needless to say, in this context, it stunned me to see two university <coughs> professors making a case for what their state's most arch segregationists were seeking. And it intrigued me that they did so, not in, the, in racist terms, but in economic terms, leveraging the authority of their discipline to back up the most anti-democratic figures in Virginia public life. They knew that they were exploiting white bigotry to move their libertarian economic agenda uh, one they referred to as the free society, even as that same legislature that created these vouchers passed five laws to take away elementary First Amendment rights from African Americans, uh, citizens in the NAACP. Um, and they showed no sympathy whatsoever for the civil rights movement of the time whose lead slogan was Freedom Now. Their cover letter to these segregationist officials, in fact, said that they were issuing this call uh, in the language of their discipline on this crucial public issue of the day, uh, quote, letting the chips fall where they may. Letting the chips fall where they may. And as a social historian, I knew where those chips would fall. And that phrase lodged itself like glass in my gut and kept me on this research trail for the ensuing 10 years to try to understand this phenomenon. They were doing this in full knowledge of the harm that they would inflict uh, given the inflamed state of white public opinion and how I wondered could anyone, especially a scholar, <coughs> do something like this? Not in mindless ignorance, but in cold-eyed calculation. Trying to solve that puzzle led me to another one, equally mystifying, because I knew so little at the time of libertarianism, either as an intellectual system or as a political cause. The new shocker, as I started to pursue this James uh, McGill Buchanan, came in another tantalizing footnote. 
A distinguished comparative political scientist, Alfred Stepan at the Columbia, mentioned in passing uh, it, it, in an article that Buchanan's Virginia School of Political Economy, as it came to be called, had a more lasting and important effect on, in, on Chile under the Pinochet dictatorship uh, than Milton Friedman's Chicago School, even though that one had received uh, extensive publicity. Now at that point, I still didn't quite know what the Virginia School was or how it differed from the Chicago School uh, because most of the Virginia faculty had attended the University of Chicago. But this made me determined to find out what was going on, what was this new school of economic thought. Following that lead, I began to seek more information about James Buchanan and I learned that he had won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1986. He was awarded that prize for having pioneered a new way of thinking called public choice economics, which also became influential in political science and law, and I learned among activists and elected officials on the right. What Buchanan did that was new was to apply Chicago-style economics to political actors and to argue that political actors, anyone in public life, should be understood just as the Chicago School understood economic actors in the marketplace, as individuals seeking their own personal self-interest, not the common good as pe people in public life claimed. And that led Buchanan to a new explanation of uh, deficits that has proved very persuasive to many. In the interest of time, I'm kind of thinking you guys aren't the deficit audience, so we can address that if we want to, but I'll kind of skip that here. But I will say that public choice economics led to a uh, new interest and new, new, new following uh, or um, um, gaming out almost of the incentives of the political process and thinking about how changing, altering the incentives uh, could lead different to different outcomes. And that's been appealing to many people beyond the right, perhaps some in this audience. But Buchanan's version, I learned, the Virginia version, was always distinctive. And Buchanan himself said in a documentary uh, that um, uh, is available that in the 1950s, the late 1950s, when he set to work, the idea of the public interest was dominant in our public life. It's not a thing, you know, but everybody would try to make their case that what they were doing was in the public interest. And he said, that's what I wanted to tear down. That was his work, to tear it down. He wanted to tear down that idea of the public interest. Again, why, I wonder, would anyone want to do that? Reading further, I learned that to a libertarian like Buchanan, there is no such thing as the common good. Any such notion of shared purpose will lead government to coerce those who don't agree with the majority. Uh, and in the case of Buchanan, uh, the argument was, and his colleagues, that this would violate the individual liberty of the minority. Um, and in the case of wealthy taxpayers who didn't share the majority's view of the public interest, such men argued, it all but steals their property. Uh, Buchanan, who was childless, used this example to convey, convey his point. What right did his fellow townspeople have to take his earnings to pay for ballet lessons for their children? We are not our brother's keeper, he insisted, or at least we should not use government to shift tax revenues from one citizen to another. And he came to talk about all this in very stark, foreboding terms, in dehumanizing language. He spoke of predators and prey and parasites and such things. So when Mitt Romney spoke of the 47% uh, a few years back, that was not new. That was coming directly out of this school of thought that portrays wealthier taxpayers as prey victimized by the predators who seek government action. It's rife in Trump's face, uh, when you can hear it if you listen for it. As I dug deeper, I learned too that those who think this way, to those who think this way, justice is a simple matter. I keep what I earn, you keep what you earn, and you collectively can only legitimately tax me if I agree with your goals and methods. Only if there is unanimity can a purpose truly be said to be fair or advocating the common good in this libertarian view. But Buchanan did not stop there. Believing this way, he moved from scholarship to organizing. Uh, and he also moved from analysis to prescription, try to what he called constitutional economics uh, in the 1970s as he began to try to uh, design a legal regime that could protect capitalism from government. 
that could enshrine the rights of the wealthy minority to a degree no society anywhere had ever done. Now, I'm going to kind of uh, limit what I say here because in the interest of time, but the uh, Chilean junta of Augusto Pinochet and its civilian backers invited him to Chile in 1980 to advise on their constitution. And the shackles that went into that constitution are still there today, keeping even super majorities of the Chilean people from doing things that the vast majority wants, like addressing the vast inequality that has come from privatizing public education and public higher education. It's now the most expensive in the OECD nations. And that kind of constitution is coming to America people, thanks to pressure from the Koch donor network at both the state and federal levels. Now, the radical rich, as I've come to think of them, seek to achieve the kind of binding change Buchanan urged without informing the public of their true goals. And thanks to assiduous organizing by the apparatus these arch-right donors have uh, funded, and the Republican Party, they have all but taken over with the big sticks of primary challenges and the uh, uh, costly carrots of uh, dark money campaign cash. Um, <coughs> this cause now has in place 27, possibly 28, of the 34 states needed to call a constitutional convention. We have not had a constitutional convention in America since 1787. This is really serious business. And they are coming to this Constitution with a whole set of what they call liberty amendments that they would like to push through that would put locks and bolts on what the American people can do, just as they put locks and bolts on what the Chilean people can do. Uh, now, I'm thinking in, um, do I have a few more minutes? OK, OK. Um, OK, so you might be wondering. <laughs> how I figured out the stealth plan of the radical right uh, and this operational strategy and end game that have eluded lots of terrific researchers and smart political observers. And the answer is by coincidence. I moved to North Carolina in 2010, uh, just as a radicalized, by the way, I was in Chicago for 20 years, so it's really nice to be back with you here today. Uh, but I moved to North Carolina in 2010, just as a radicalized Republican Party, uh, dominated and funded by the Koch brothers and their, uh, their North Carolina affiliate, won majorities in both houses of the state legislature in the Tea Party wave. And suddenly, the things that I was reading about in Buchanan's work and struggling with that still seem so abstract became very concrete and frightening. The North Carolina General Assembly's lead donor, a man named Art Pope, uh, boasted through his organizations of the big bang his grantees were developing, making, again they boasted, this once moderate state a laboratory for what they called the conservative cause. Now that's interesting because this cause now flies under the banner of conservatism because its architects will realize that it will never attract public following if they tell them that they are radical libertarians. Uh, but the founders were much more honest about their radicalism, uh, Buchanan included, uh, and they rejected the label of conservatism. But experience taught that this wouldn't lead to the breakthrough. Anyway, what did I see happening in North Carolina <clears throat> after that election? A shock and awe style, big <coughs> of radical changes on virtually every front that you could imagine. And Buchanan had long argued that if you wanted to see radical change in outcomes, you should stop focusing on who rules and you should think about the rules. Forget the personalities, think about the structures, think about the operating rules. Well, what I watched unfold in North Carolina was a stunning barrage of radical rules changes on this model, one after another. Extreme gerrymandering to misrepresent the will of the electorate, new measures to undermine workers' ability to organize in unions, particularly in public sector unions, attacks on public education at all levels, uh, from uh, pre preschool through uh, college, uh, and radical cuts in funding for public education, repeal of a hard-won racial justice act to uh, ensure better uh, and, and, and more fair policing, refusal to accept med the Medicaid expansion of Obamacare despite a crying need for health care among the people uh, who would have benefited from that, rolling back measures to protect the environment and reduce global warming, breaking with customary procedures on, in all of this, and also, to cap it all off, what became known as the Monster Voter Suppression Bill. And what proved so disturbing to me as both a scholar and a citizen was that I could see 
this new majority was applying the kinds of ideas that came out of the Buchanan School of Political Economy guided by his analysis of the political process. Uh, and it saddened me that people on my side were not able to see this. And I can say more about that in the discussion, but I want to want to keep things here. But basically, um, this legislature was inflicting grievous harm on the citizenry of North Carolina. And they were doing so in cold calculation. You could say they, too, were letting the chips fall where they may in their bid to achieve their utopia. Um, So one thing that I could see that, that the critics uh, did not, even the brilliant Reverend William Barber of the NAACP, who created an inspiring movement called Moral Mondays, was that this agenda was backed by an ethical system that gave these actors confidence and made them feel heroic enough to weather the storm of criticism and opposition they faced. It's an ethical system foreign to most of us, and in fact, it runs counter to all the world's great religious traditions. But it is a coherent ethical system with stark coherence that we need to understand if we are to <coughs> how to deal with the crisis that Buchanan's ideas and Koch's money have wrought. To wit, the libertarian morality, and we're seeing this play out in Washington right now, libertarian morality says it would be better to have people die from lack of health care than to receive it from government, from taxes paid for by others. This really is what they mean when they talk about personal responsibility. You should be on your own. And if you fail to save for your future needs, you deserve your fate. Some of them even add a kind of twist that's kind of suggesting that witnessing your suffering will teach others how to save. I learned all this and more in 2013 when James Buchanan died, because finally that September, I got access to his private archive at George Mason University. Ironically, just as a government shutdown led by congressional Republicans such as Ted Cruz, uh, who are familiar with Buchanan's ideas, was unfolding in Washington, D.C. at such cost to so many. In an application <coughs> of the kind of coercive bargaining that Buchanan had taught the right and corporate allies over decades by then. And in Buchanan's records, I found my developing understanding confirmed in a way that literally took my breath away. Just one example. In his private office, I found stacked, helter-skelter, on a chair, a pile of documents that exposed how Charles Koch and George Mason economics faculty members had combined to establish a base camp for this political project in a public university just across the Potomac from our nation's capital. Once I brought home all the hundreds of documents that I'd copied there and put them together with Buchanan's writings and other sources, I found myself laying down pieces of a puzzle that sometimes literally nauseated me in its scope and audacity. Because it now encompasses dozens of ostensibly separate national organizations, some of whose names may be familiar to you, the Heritage Foundation and the Cato Institute, to just take two, but there are many, many more. Uh, and if you include the state level operations that make up the state policy network, and you of course have your own uh, uh, affiliate here, um, and the international affiliates of the so-called Atlas Network with operations in over 90 countries, we are talking about hundreds of organizations working to radically alter government and society to bring their utopian vision of free reign capitalism into being. And what was so offensive to me as a citizen um, was that they were not being honest with the people about what they want, about what the true end game was. Instead, they were feeding the people uh, anodyne slogans like pro-growth policies and limited government while conducting this radical rules change. And as I took the measure of this project, I saw something else as a historian, that the form of government these men see as ideal as enacting their vision of liberty, the free society as they call it, mirrored that of mid-century Virginia in all but the state-mandated racial segregation. When James Buchanan set to work in Charlottesville in 1956 at the peak of massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education, that state had just been identified by V.O. Key, a classic political scientist, as the most oligarchical state in the South and therefore in America. O'Key said, next to Virginia, Mississippi is a hotbed of democracy. Now I could go in to 
making the case for what I've just said, but all, but I don't want to because I want us to get to the discussion. But I can tell you that all of that stuff that I just described in North Carolina is essentially a kind of reverse engineering to bring back the kind of policies that prevailed in Virginia before the civil rights movement opened up the state to real democracy. And the question this stealth plan presents Americans with is, once we know it, is at one level quite simple. Do we want to live in a cosmetically updated version of 1950s Virginia, a place that has crushed democracy and human dignity to allow its elites free reign, a state determined to try to prevent the kind of government that citizen action has demanded since at least the populist movement of the 1890s, a government that can stand up to corporations that run roughshod over the people, that can protect workers' rights and public health, that can ensure the economic security of the aged, that can stop discrimination, and that can improve our air and water quality uh, and address the, the crisis of our planet. All of this and more is at risk, I believe. And so I conclude with a question to consider in the current crisis of American politics. Is what this cause seeks the kind of country we want to live in and bequeath to our children and future generations? That is the real public <coughs> choice. And if we delay answering much longer, those who are imposing their stark utopia will decide for us. Thank you. Dr. McLean. Um, so I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Jane Rhodes, um, head of the uh, African American Studies Department, and uh, Dr. Alexandra Falindra um, to the uh, podium. Uh, Dr. Falindra is an assistant professor of political science here at UIC. Um, we'll do maybe a slightly shortened 15 minutes ish uh, conversation. Yep. Um, if you have, if you've already written a question on your card, we're going to be collecting them, and we will then collect them again um, in, uh, when we're done with the uh, the panel discussion. So, uh, thank you. And you're just going to have this conversation. I don't know if my microphone is I on. Think it, is. it is. Okay. okay. So, are we hooked up? <coughs> thank you, Nancy. So I'll I'll just go ahead for the the sake of. Um, timeliness and efficacy, because we really want the conversation to be you all and not the talking heads at the front of the room. Um, but I did have a couple of comments. I wanted to thank Nancy for bringing out of the archives and into the light this constitutive history um, of politics and scholarship in the, in the service of the powerful, um, which is what I think you've really mapped out well. Um, this is work that reflects both great research and analysis. <coughs> great research and analytical skill and courage. And I want to sort of really gesture to that in particular. Uh, we live in frightening times when individuals and groups are committed to a level of harassment and hate mongering that goes far beyond any pretense of civil discourse. Right? And you talked about that earlier. And Dr. McLean gives us much to chew on and debate. And that debate is healthy and necessary. Um, and this work is critical, a critical contribution to understanding both the nation's troubling and volatile political history and the mess that we're in today. So I just wanted to appreciate that Dr. McLean has done what many historians are told not to do, um, to make explicit links between past and present, to make bold assertions about the character and motivations of those you study, um, and to take a principled stand, and, and I, I, I very much appreciate this. As she said, this isn't an easy read. I won't say I was curled up in a fetal position, <laughs> but um, it, it is quite devastating. Um, it, it, you can feel very overwhelmed by this project, but that's precisely why we need it, because we need to get past an emotional response and really unpack it. Um, so uh, just a couple of comments that I wanted to make uh, from my own um, uh, areas of interest. I was struck by a lot of things, the way that you map out the continuity of libertarian um, conservative politics, starting really with the so-called founding fathers through the defense of slavery, through the backlash to civil rights, and into the sort of alt-right um, conservative politics today. Um, and at the core of this, as I do not see conspiracy theory, but rather a recognition that this very small, intensely powerful and committed group of moneyed elites 
have always seen America through the lens that you've talked about. Um, one that views uh, the masses as a population to be contained and suppressed, mm -hmm. and that um, sees unfettered capitalism and individual liberty as overriding the public need. And I won't go on more about that because I think you've talked about that eloquently. But one of the things that I see particularly uh, underpinning this, which you, you mentioned um, quite eloquently, is the ways in which this really highlights and reinforces the ways that white supremacy are fuel and fodder for this movement. And I, I like the way that you talk about both that they're exploiting white supremacists, mm -hmm. um, and we've seen this in all of the recent political elections where you have folks who might identify with that ideological strand who nevertheless are voting against their own interest. Um, so they're being exploited for that purpose. Um, but also um, that it, um, um, it gives sustenance and nurtures uh, white supremacy um, in, in, in important ways. Capitalism needs an underclass of workers. And in the American South, this has historically been black people, although that's certainly changed in the last few generations. Racial ideologies and a politics and culture of anti-blackness was necessary to rationalize and support this uh, conservative libertarian cause. And so I just, those of, most of you haven't read the book, and so I just wanted to pull, pull out and highlight a couple of interesting sort of moments that really underpin the, the ways in which race is so um, deeply embedded in this, um, this project. Um, Dr. McLean describes how in 1847, the southerner John Calhoun warned a black abolitionist to stay out of the city of Charleston um, because free blacks might excite their fellow Africans into insurrection. Um, and this is very much a sort of foundational uh, sort of anxiety that's in the service of this, this politic. Um, the long civil rights movement of the 20th century, which yielded the Brown decision of the Voting Rights Act, um, were among, uh, provided the meat for many of these economic theories. Um, and you quoted um, another one of your protagonists, Buchanan, who talked about how um, resistance to voting rights was critical to prevent, quote, colored heels upon white necks. Um, and those are just a few of the, the, the really fascinating points that, that um, came up. So, you know, one of the things that, I, I, that is happening at, in this historical moment is not only the, um, the enactment of this stealth project that you so skillfully map out, but also um, really showing um, the, the interplay between resistance and social movements, right? Mm -hmm. um, that at, at every instance, there's a, a new strategy to sort of push back on any um, backlash um, politics. Um, and in our national imagination, black revolt is, are people like um, the crazed slave Nat Turner or some evil purveyor of hate as Malcolm X was often called. Um, but we fail to note that that is, that black resistance it has always been a sort of critical part of this exchange. Um, I, I wanted to, I'm, I think we'll, we want to move on to the question and answers, but I do, um, this really made me think a great deal about James Baldwin in particular. Um, and I think uh, the ways in which in the 1960s, he saw quite clearly um, the, the ways in which uh, this project, the, the sort of broad um, um, libertarian uh, ethos, um, in this, and the ways in which white supremacy was serving it, um, operated to prevent black people from being able to um, enact any form of resistance, whether it was the NAACP or whether it was the Black Panther Party. Um, and, and I just wanted to, to read this quote um, from uh, a 1968 televi television interview with James Baldwin, uh, in which he said, when the Israelis pick up guns, or the Poles, or the Irish, or any white man in the world says, give me liberty, or give me death, the entire white world applauds. But if a black man says exactly the same thing, word for word, he's called a criminal and treated like one. And everything possible is done to make an example so that this bad nigger won't, won't reproduce more like him. Okay? And so I thought about that in the context of the cries for liberty yeah. that your libertarian um, um, actors here are, are engaging with uh, on a daily basis. And, and I wanted to sort of 
put out a couple of questions that we might chew on but it, and might jive with, with others' questions as well. Um, in particular, the genealogy of this is really coming out of the South. Mm -hmm. And um, you're looking at uh, uh, Buchanan, who has these deep roots from Tennessee, who, who really carries out this le legacy of, a, of, of a Southern white um, protectionism um, and libertarianism. Um, how much of the, the broader project is Southern, in your view? Mm -hmm. um, and and, and I, it's, it's fascinating to me, in some ways, how this gets taken up by a mm -hmm. Coke, um, even by a kind of Northern um, moneyed elite. Um, who might not otherwise sort of identify with Southern culture. So, um, you know, at some point perhaps you could, you could um, talk about that. And also, um, you know, the ways in which this sort of the interplay with um, uh, black resistance and other forms of resistance seems to provide greater energy and fuel for this movement. So I'll leave that there. And thank you. Thank you so much. Great. So should I? Okay, so I, uh, I, I've read this book, um, Democracy and Change, twice so far, and uh, I even listened to it as an audio book. Um, wow. on, uh, on my recent trip to Europe, my husband, who's a historian, uh, was blindsided, didn't know that driving through the rolling hills of Greece, he was going to be listening to an incredibly frightening story. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Um, and my first reaction to this book was that, oh my god, this needs an FDA black box label um, to warn <laughs> for anxiety and severe panic. Um, it, really, it really has that effect on you. Uh, and it is a way, a paradox, that a book that is so well written uh, has such an emotionally painful thing to read. Um, it, it is a narrative that is really, really easy to read cognitively, incredibly difficult to grasp emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, it is also because it brings to light a number of very important connections between the theory of practice of politics as it has developed on the right. And this is something that interests me personally as a political scientist, hence the double reading here. Um, as a political scientist, what I took away from democracy and change um, is really three things. That ideas matter, that political entrepreneurs matter, mm -hmm. and that race matters. And this is what I mean. Um, public choice theory as developed by Buchanan uh, has been a very, very important and valuable indeed tool in my own discipline. Expecting that politicians are self-interested and they're motivated by getting reelected uh, serves a really useful heuristic uh, that allow us to develop expectations about political behavior of political actors. Yet, even at the time when Buchanan was writing this work, uh, we knew enough from the emerging field of political psychology uh, and behavioral economics to know that this type uh, useful, this trope, useful as it may be, um, does not really represent, is not a true representation of human behavior. Uh, if anything, the literature over the past two decades has shown that identities and cultures, religions and ethnicities, uh, matter a lot more uh, than naked material interests. And people are willing to take risks and assume costs in an effort to protect their groups, not their pocketbooks. Furthermore, objectives and performance in, in the polis, uh, as Deborah Stone has told us, uh, is not reducible to material benefits and thus not commensurable. Justice and equality and security uh, and efficiency are all ideals of political community and that you can't measure them down to a numeric value uh, and not all citizens agree on how they should be prioritized. Buchanan and his supporters turned a very um, faulty understanding of human behavior into a theory of politics that they sought to brand not only as an empirical orthodoxy, but also as a normative prerogative. Uh, striving to achieve maximal self-interest and ensuring that our society allows us to do so without constraints, they tell us, is the ultimate objective for the good life. Ideas 
matter because some of these ideas from time to time manage to escape the confines of academia and books and journals and they make it into public life. And this is such a case. Um, regardless of the intention of their creators, uh, they can take a life of their own and have major political consequences potentially affecting the life of millions. Libertarianism is one such idea. This is a philosophy that is appealing because of its simplicity. Mm -hmm. It's intuitive, makes sense kind of quality. It is very tempted to think that society is a collection of individuals seeking to achieve the best for themselves and that the public good is an aggregation of each individual's preferences. This in turn allows us to see individual outcomes as the result of individual effort and ability, which is also very satisfying. Uh, luck and heredity and structural advantages, the nasty details that the devil has put in there, um, do not make it into this simple and alluring picture. Um, it is a reality that is emotionally satisfying because it allows us to attribute all of our successes to ourselves uh, and all of our failures to lack of liberty. Pol political entrepreneurs, sellers of ideals, also matter. Um, this idea, as Nancy shows in great detail, could not have leaped off the pages of academic journals if it weren't for two things, Buchanan's own ambition to influence politics and his interaction with the Koch network. Numerous studies in political science have documented the important role that political entrepreneurs such as Buchanan and the Koch brothers have played in advancing ideas to the political agenda. Ideas often become policy not because they represent the best available uh, solution or because they have tested results, but because a powerful network promotes them as solutions to all kinds of different problems. It is no accident that we have the healthcare system that we have. Mm -hmm. These were ideas that were promoted actually by the Heritage Foundation. Um, and uh, in, Ameri in the American context though, also the third thing that matters is race. Libertarian ideas were not successful as a response to the Great Depression in the 1930s, partly because Americans at the time had experience with the ravages of the free market, but also because the intended spoils of the social safety net were going to go, were explicitly went to white people. Um, my research shows that libertarianism became incredibly popular, as you can predict from Nancy's study, um, by what, with white Americans in the new century. In 1992, 34% of white Americans supported small government ideology. By 2012, 57% prioritized small government libertarian ideologies. This success is surely in part the result of Buchanan's ingenious divide and conquer strategy meant to, act to activate group um, resentments and thus weaken support for government involvement in the economy. By adopting this type of playbook, the Republican Party has succeeded in disseminating the message that government is a political agent that promotes the interest of the undeserving groups at the expense of the deserving ones, which is exactly the uh, playbook that Buchanan set up. Um, this message is loud and clear in survey data, but also in Arlie Hochschild's recent book, Strangers in the Rome mm -hmm. Not Land. Uh, what Nancy's historical narrative adds to this picture is the deep story of how and why libertarianism fused with such group resentment, mm -hmm. how, why it was strategically positioned to do so. It is the scary missing link that connects the history of racial realignment and the politics and sociology of anti-government sentiment. And it is an incredibly scary picture that she paints. So the question that, um, I want to ask uh, of you, Nancy, is it has to do more with the academic and intellectual side. Universities have played an incredible role here. And academics, we see, play an, an incredible role here. So from this perspective, what should be the role of academia? Uh, we are a university here that uh, promotes and supports activism. Uh, public engagement and, pol and engagement of scholars with the public and sort of disseminating their, our ideas is an important 
goal of the university that we have actually embraced. Um, given that you have a state university in this case that is taking on basically becoming the incubator of ideas that are so destructive, um, how do we handle, reconcile this, our need for, you know, from a progressive perspective, yes, we want to promote progressive ideas and disseminate mm -hmm. them, while I really would have liked for Buchanan not to have been able to do what he did. <laughs> that was essentially one of the questions that was asked by somebody, so why don't you start? Oh, you okay. Okay, uh, and well, thank you both for those brilliant and really generative comments. I actually want to get copies of them to keep, keep thinking about. Um, so on that question, I mean, I think it's very important that universities be engaged with the wider society and engaged with the issues and challenges that they're facing. I mean, I got my degree at the University of Wisconsin. That was the Wisconsin idea, you know, the public university and the service of society. So I think that's all good. I think the key thing is transparency you know, and openness. And what I found in Buchanan's papers over and over again was a lack of transparency and this opening up of back channels to the higher administration and to special donors um, and using his access to the higher administration to actually punish those he didn't agree with, whether they were student uh, protesters or they were faculty who had different opinions from his. So I think, I think that would be part of it. And I will say, because there's so many young people here, I would encourage you to check out this wonderful organization. I would encourage everybody to check it out, but especially the young people and the faculty too, to send money, um, to a group called Uncoke My Campus with a K um, that I only discovered after I went to press. Um, they are just extraordinary. They are the only organization in the country that is focused full time on dealing with this Coke challenge. Um, and they are particularly dealing with the way that it's corrupting academic integrity and transparency in our public universities. Uh, they just sued George Mason University in February. They had their day in court last week. I encourage you again, go to the website. You'll hear more about it. But I think that's the main thing. What they're saying is, look, especially in this context in which these legislators have cut university budgets so much, it's understandable that administrators need to look to donors, but all donors should be playing by the same rules, and those rules should be transparent. The American Association of University Professors has guidelines on how these, these contributions should be made. George Mason faculty are working on those guidelines. I think some of the people, Buchanan actually talked about creating a gravy train when he was building a counterintelligentsia. That was his phrase. And he wanted to get in place a lot of people who would be ideological, who would be picked for these positions because of their ideology and would advance the program, which he called the grand strategy. So that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with. This is not traditional academia. This is not um, the way things should be done. So I applaud these young people who are trying to restore transparency and, and intellectual integrity so that there can be that. I mean, I don't have any objection. I mean, whatever your ideology is, like people have a right to make the case for it, you know, make the best case they possibly can. What was so upsetting to me in this was to see the stealth and the dishonesty and the going around the backs of people. Um, so that's why I say on that. And then on the question of the South, I thought that was such an interesting um, issue too. One of the things that I, I found in this research that really stunned me is that the, the fact that it was the South didn't make any di difference for these Northern libertarians. And I actually had so much more in the long draft of the book than the final draft. It was about twice as long, but there was a huge section on how essentially the entire libertarian cause at the time was elated that Southern state government governments were, as they said, going out of the public school business or talking about it. And they were thrilled to see these new private academies with no complaint about there being segregationist academies because to free market economists like Friedman, discrimination, prejudice is just a taste and people have a right to have their tastes honored. Um, so, so there was just a huge enthusiasm for this. And also one of the things I try to point out in the book is they shared the same model of political economy. You know, they didn't like unions. They didn't like the fact that we had Social Security, that we were getting Medicare. They didn't want, Milton Friedman opposed the Civil Rights Act too. You know, so you didn't have to be a Southerner to have these politics. Um, Southerners were often the most vocal because these ideas were so familiar and they'd grown up with them. But the Northern libertarians shared much of this and Coke too. He started a private um, academy for whites um, in 1967, just as the federal government got serious about uh, anti-discrimination. The National Review so, too. Yeah, it was so I'd like, yeah, I'd like to get to some of the, of the questions since mm -hmm. that we promised. And the first one, uh, there are some more sort of detailed ones, but I want to start with one that I think is, 
it is just something you can clarify for, mm -hmm. the, for the audience, because it is important. Um, if they get the 34 states to meet for the convention, what does that mean for the rights of the people and what exactly is in danger? Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, it's a huge danger because, again, we have not had a constitutional convention since 1787 when the document was created and the people who went to the convention came up with something different from what they were sent to do. So there are rules that um, uh, stipulate how you send delegates, but once you get there, it's, it's open. So they could come up with all kinds of things and we would find ourselves in great trouble. There are some journalists who have been reporting on this. You know, I urge you to look for it. It's really important. But you know, as so much of our media just talks about Trump's latest tweet, we are missing these huge changes that are going through, like this push for constitutional convention, like radical changes in 30 states now utterly dominated by this radical Republican Party, like my own, where huge changes are going through. In federal agencies, this is happening. Um, you know, it's really, um, it's really an issue. And I think that also, just one thing I'd say to go back to that question about, I, I love that you, you pointed out, Alexandra, that um, Buchanan's original ideas were a, a helpful heuristic for thinking about politics, and they opened up some fresh questions. And I, I totally agree with that and like it. I think what's happened now that these donors have gotten involved is this is um, uh, calcified into a rigid dogma. And I actually see that in the mail I get and in the critiques of my work that have come from the libertarian right. It is a rigid dogma. And I now actually believe it's a deadly dogma. Because if you look at the reaction to uh, the recent hurricanes, to Harvey and to Irma, and the fact that so many on the right actually said that these, these weren't going to be bad, that it was just people trying to get money for the left or something, like these crazy things. Or you look at climate science denial. The, the Koch donor network is a leading supporter of climate science misinformation, denying the science that's coming from all our best climate scientists. And that is literally deadly for people around the world. That is happening. So I think that's where you really see what was once, as you said, this, this helpful, stimulating heuristic calcifying into something that is, is I think, really menacing um, our, our politics today. Um, if, I'm, I'm going to add one thing to the answer about the Constitutional Convention. That's where you can change the Constitution. So that's where they could take away the First Amendment, for example. We think of the Constitution as something that doesn't change, it's just there. But that's what a Constitutional Convention is for. So I just want to make sure that that very sort of basic idea um, is understood in terms yeah. of what the danger is. It's actually a danger to the whole Constitution, which tells us who can vote and tells us about equal protection and the First Amendment, religious freedom, so on and so forth. Um, okay, so connecting a little bit to what you just said a moment ago, I have a question here, I can read it. Um, do you think that there is a connection between the radical economic libertarianism of those like Buchanan and the more recent strain of technological libertarianism of Silicon Valley types like Peter Thiel? Mm. Both groups seem to have a, some, a, oh, a utopian vision for the future of capitalism and government. Do you think these visions are complementary or antagonistic? Such a great question. Uh, and it was not part of my research to look at the Silicon Valley connections, but whoever mentioned Peter Thiel, that is a very apt choice. Um, he has actually been called by Charles Koch's partner at George Mason, a man named Tyler Cohen, who actually has the most popular economics professional economics blog in the country, he has been called one of our greatest public intellectuals, Peter Thiel. Now, this is a man who has said democ capitalism is more important than democracy, who seems to rue that women got the right to vote because it led to more government action, um, and who has taken out New Zealand citizenship because he's not so happy with America and wants to be able to flee when he can. So, so I do think that there is a way in which we have let inequality develop to a point in our society um, that we now have this class of billionaires, and many of them are in this hedge fund world, and some like you know in the Silicon Valley world or where they come together, where they are so insulated from the rest of us. I don't think they even know who we are, how we operate, but they've become hostile to us, I think, and to our model of government. And you see that in the commentary of Peter Thiel, and you know, people can look up his remarks, but it's it's really it's kind of chilling. And the influence that these people have yes. in politics is enormous. Recent research by Marty Gillens from Princeton University mm -hmm. and Ben Page from Northwestern that looked at the 100 or 200 richest people in the world. Like, we're not talking about the 1%. We're talking about the 0.0001%. Yeah. And compared their preferences and political ideals to the rest of us, and the gap is enormous. 
And these people's ideals are what is being uh, basically reflected in politics today. And we saw it two days ago mm -hmm. with the piggy bank, uh, yeah. bank comment, yeah. right? That the Koch brothers piggy bank is closed to the Republicans until they pass mm -hmm. um, the repeal of ACA. And may I add, that's, that's also using this Buchananite understanding of changing the rules, right? Not, you know, it doesn't matter who you get in office, but change the rules and the incentives. So the way that the Koch network has applied this is to create these vast pools of cash that have been enabled by the Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, which the Cato Institute and others pushed for, unleashing uh, this dark money in politics um, in the name of combating monopoly. But they are using these vast pools of cash to run primary challenges against any Republican who doesn't toe the line on what the donors want. So what they've managed to do to make it clear is make the donors accountable to these extreme right billionaire donors rather than even to Republican uh, uh, party members in their own party. And we see this again in the healthcare legislation. Why are they trying to push this horrific bill that nobody wants without regular procedure? Because the donors want it, even if the voters don't. And they have to deliver to the donors or they will get primaried, a new verb, but if they, they toe the line, then the piggy banks will open again. It's really, it's really, it's that crude and it's, it's um, And in the stunning. open. I yes. mean, when yes. you make when, these yeah. comments yeah. openly. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so, um, and I got it, there were a few questions kind of along this line. Um, do we need an alternative radical left movement? Was that what Franklin Roosevelt was facing during his time? That's a really interesting question, too. I mean, I do think that this is thoroughgoing enough, this project, and that it builds on changes that have been underway, you know, at least since the late 1970s, that to stop it, I think, will take a kind of reinvigoration of our civil society and of people's sense that it's not just like, I'm, I, I, I hate these conversations when you talk to people who think that they're politically engaged. You say, so who's it going to be in 2020? You know, as if that's the issue. And the one thing I would take from Buchanan is stop focusing on the personalities. I'm sick to death of Bernie versus Hillary or Hillary versus Bernie. You know, let's talk about what's going on in our society, these radical rules changes, what's going on in state policy that 80% of people don't pay attention to, and that's why these guys are concentrating on the states because they know that. You know, let's think about all those things, and I think to do that, as Naomi Klein has brilliantly said, no is not enough, right? You also have to have a vision of what you're working for. So I'd love to see more robust discussion of what what we think a good society would be in this new century and these new uh, conditions. So I, I think that's a great idea. One follow-up on that, which was in um, another question, uh, is basically if the, um, if the right's objective is to change the rules and, and control and own the public medium, what, how, do you, how are you going to get to that arena to, to challenge? Hmm. In other words, where, where yeah. does it actually, again, you're well, a historian, you're not research, a... Yeah. Um, um, so yes, I'm a historian, so I'm better at analyzing and explaining how we got here than, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but I will say that actually beginning in the civil rights era, that's when we first saw the attacks on the liberal media, and there's been some good work on that by uh, various scholars and journalists. That's where the first attacks on the liberal media came up, because they said the North was treating the South, meaning the segregationists, unfairly. Um, so some northern newspaper editors tried to organize to get a different kind of media, and then that's really taken off with the rise of Fox News and Breitbart and all these other things. So they're definitely out there, and it is frightening to me that, you know, as a, again, as a scholar and a citizen, that we are now living in a country in which a, a large section of our population who has been bombarded with these ideas now for decades thinks that facts really don't matter. You know, that you can't trust, you like the mainstream news. Um, and I don't know where we go with that, but I guess, I guess the thing I will come back to, which is the most hopeful uh, part of my book, I think, is to remember that this cause that, that we're talking about is doing what it's doing because they understand that they are a permanent minority cause. That if they actually say that what, what they truly stand for, what the end game is, and what their policies will result in, people will recoil and oppose them. And they know this because they've tried it before. With Barry Goldwater, Ronald Reagan pulled back from the brink, George W. Bush backed up from the brink. So they know they have to push in this way to do this. So to my mind, 
again, as citizen and scholar, I think knowledge is power. And I think the farther we can spread this message, the wider we spread this message to activate that latent majority who of good people. I think most Americans are really good, decent people. I think people are under a lot of pressure. They're confused. They get angry. They're stressed. They're whatever. But I think people are basically de decent. And I think most Americans value the idea that we have a democracy, however flawed it is. And I think if they understand what an existential threat it's under, I think those people can be spoken to. So I also think of. Um, the black feminist, uh, Bernice Johnson Reagan, who wrote a brilliant piece about coalition building in the 1980s, who said at one point that if you're not feeling the strain, you're not doing the work, you know, that we need to be out talking to people who don't agree with us, right, and getting out to, to venues where conversations might be difficult, but this is really important work that we need to do if we're going to reinvigorate our civil society and, and save a democracy. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in? Yes, sure. Um, the other thing that is important is to actually, in terms of knowledge, one of the key things that people don't understand is what government does for you. Suzanne Medler, a political scientist, has a really brilliant book called The Submerged State. Um, but basically, we don't know what we get out of government, and that makes it easy for people to attack government. We don't know that I have students who would refuse in my class to accept that in-state tuition is a benefit that government gives them. Um, they know that they receive in-state tuition, they just will not accept that it's a benefit. Um, understanding, making people understand, explaining to them, making visible government and its role in our lives is important. Um, my husband is an environmental historian and he's talking about the difference of visible versus invisible pollution. When you see the smokestacks and then the smoke goes away, it is easy to make the attribution to the law and to the government efforts. When you don't see the pollution because it's in the water, because it is in things that are not visible, then it's much more difficult to understand the size of the pro problem or what government is doing for you. So making government legible and making government visible is a first step to actually, um, I think, getting people appreciate again the role of government. Because right now, all they see is what they perceive government is doing for other people, not, not for them. OK, um, here's another question. Um, uh, J.S. Mill advocated for policies that are, on your view, anti-democratic, uh, i.e. no public education. But he did so in the name of liberty and common good that people might use his argument in a way he didn't uh, intend, uh, didn't, I'm sorry, he, he use his argument in a way he didn't doesn't, doesn't make J.S. Mill like, doesn't it make it like them? Is the same true of Buchanan? I think the idea is that are people taking his ideas, uh -huh. which he didn't want to use in this way, uh -huh. and now using them in this way? Yeah, oh, okay, so well, I'll, I'll leave John Stuart Mill there, um, uh, but, but take the point about um, Buchanan. And this is actually really, um, interesting to me because um, I, I, it was a challenge to me, like working on this and, and trying to figure out this guy and you know really where he was going. I will say that from the beginning, he was always reaching out to these state political leaders and and um, uh, uh, pleasing them, the elites in, in Virginia. Um, and he did less well when Virginia democratized and there was a new set of elites. <laughs> um, uh, and he got really angry and, and left um, uh, and then came back after they'd gotten more conservative. So, um, so I think he was always political and always uh, working on these things. And as I said, he set out to create a counterintelligentsia after the campus revolts of the um, uh, 1960s. Um, at the same time, there's a really interesting uh, episode in the conclusion where I think Buchanan was actually kind of horrified at what the Cokes have done with his name and with his institution. And he actually protested. Um, Charles Koch made his first huge contribution to George Mason in, in 1997. And it was actually going to be named the James Buchanan Center, this thing that they were creating. Well, Charles Koch's people came in and put all these little apparatchiks, you know, these people who had no academic connections. They were hacks of this libertarian cause. And they started calling, like one called himself the president of the Buchanan Center, and others were doing other things. Wendy Graham, uh, who was then on the board of Enron, which collapsed, and, and her husband was a sitting US senator, which really got, was a thorn in Buchanan's side. Phil Graham was pushing through financial de deregulation and making a partisan case for this, which was illegal. Buchanan felt humiliated. 
He said, and I quote it in the book, he said he felt exploited. Um, he wanted nothing to do with these Koch people anymore. So actually, at the end of his life, he pulled aside uh, and didn't want anything to do with what they were doing because he thought what they were doing and the way that they were manipulating this partisan political process was grotesque. Um, and so I just find that so interesting. And I think that's maybe one reason why the libertarian right and these Koch funded um, faculty have been attacking my work so much is they don't want their people to kind of get to that conclusion, you know, and see that this is how shabbily they treated both, both the Koch people and the university administrators at George Mason who have bought into this. They pushed aside their Nobel Prize winner in order to please Charles Koch, who became the university's biggest donor. So yes, I think his ideas uh, have probably been taken to a place that he never quite dreamed that they would be, but he also published a, a memoir in 2007 that said, literally, I have no regrets. So it's kind of a mystery to me at the end of the day. Um, would you argue that the USA is turning into an oligarchy? Yes. I mean, I think, I don't even think, I mean, that plut or plutocracy is another word. I mean, that's not just me. I mean, that's many of our leading economists, um, Joseph Stieglitz, you know, uh, Paul Krugman, Larry Bartel, you know, many people in political science that you've talked about. I mean, if you think about a system uh, that is, I mean, I don't think it's irredeemable, but, you know, there's been many empirical studies of our system now by political scientists and by economists who say that these wealthy donors um, uh, have so skewed the rules that, um, that our system is really distorted at this point. So for example, for working class people, I mean, not being able to come together and have collective voice in a labor union um, means that you can't, you can't equalize the field of play at all. You don't have what they called at the mid-century countervailing power. And so we've seen that nearly all the income gains of the last few decades, and particularly since the financial crisis, have gone to those on the higher end of the spectrum, and particularly to those that you were calling the you know, zero point, you know, point zero 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 one percent or whatever it is. So I think our system is already distorted and I think that's why Bernie Sanders did so well in the last election because so many people instinctively recognize that there's a problem. Um, but, but I also believe that you know, um, there are things that can be done about that. Um, how did the wars, Vietnam and the Cold War, and more recent events such as Iraq, affect the small government ideology in contrast to the influence of Buchanan's ideas? Mm -hmm. In other words, is it a multi? Yeah. So there's, there's always um, divisions about those things. Buchanan himself, um, uh, like um, Hayek, uh, another one of these free market luminaries, rejected the name conservatives, uh, con conservative, or the, the whatever, the um, descriptor conservative at different points. On the other hand, in his foreign policy, he always really lined up with conservatives. Um, so he was an avid supporter of the Vietnam War and the Cold War. Um, and uh, at the same time, though, the, the network associated with Charles Koch was for a long time very anti-war. So these were the people who didn't want the U.S. to get involved in World War II. They called it the America First movement, a, a term that's back with us um, again. And originally, the Cato Institute and some of these Koch-funded efforts were anti-war as well as anti-social welfare state. And that's another interesting thing, I think, that I think Charles Koch himself is the biggest donor to all this on this cause by far um, switched from demanding ideological consistency and no compromise in the 1970s to doing whatever it takes to achieve this nonviolent revolution uh, or so far nonviolent revolution uh, today so so they are very much supporting you know a hawkish foreign policy even though they you know they're same people criticized that kind of thing years before. So it's more, I, 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 that was a long way of saying it's more opportunistic now. Um, this is an, another kind of interesting kind of legal one. Do you think there's a relationship between the judgment uh, that corporations are people and your argument? Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that notion actually goes back to um, the demise of Reconstruction when a conservative Supreme Court after Reconstruction, the effort to enfranchise and include African Americans in the political process after the Civil War, after that was crushed by conservative white Southerners, um, a Supreme Court that upheld segregation uh, and upheld disenfranchisement also 
um, distorted a 14th Amendment that was designed to promote African American fair treatment for African Americans into making it fair treatment for corporations. So that is the judicial model that this Koch and libertarian network um, believes in. Buchanan many times said he thought the rules of 1900, the, the legal and constitutional rules of 1900, were preferable to those of 1960, you know, when he was writing this particular quote that I'm quoting. But um, so yeah, their model is that kind of Gilded Age Supreme Court for the legal scholars here, like um, the provost, the, the Lochner Court. The, they thought that was good when the Supreme Court would strike down all of these reforms that were coming out of the states and elsewhere uh, in the name of upholding corporate freedom. So this, I didn't really get into it, but this is a huge legal project too, not just the Constitutional Convention, but a, a systematic effort to change the nation's law schools and its courts, and actually Buchanan's partner uh, at George Mason uh, for some time, a, a guy named Henry Manny, was crucial as an entrepreneur in the field of law and economics. And at one point, he was funded by Koch from the beginning in uh, when he started about 1970. And by the early 1990s, um, he his summer trading institutes, they called it Henry Manny Camp, had trained two fifths of the federal judiciary in this law, these law and economics ideas that he was selling to corporations and saying, you know, like we're protecting your interests like nobody else is, give us money. So it's, 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 it's a really radical and encompassing project to transform our whole society, but with a particular emphasis on changing our, our rules of governance, which mean the law and the constitution. Right, and I think you mentioned the Olin uh, yeah. Foundation and as well as the Federalist Society, which yes. also comes out. Yeah out of this. Um, all right, uh, Gary Nash wrote of the three tenets of modern conservatism, libertarianism, traditionalists, and cold warriors. Maybe the cold warriors can be replaced by today by social conservatives or the religious right. How do your radical libertarians play with the other conservatives? Again, now they play well, but in the earlier years, many of these libertarians were atheists. Buchanan was particularly atheistic and actually yelled at a colleague who came in on Ash Wednesday, a co-author of his who was his peer. He came in with ashes in his forehead and Buchanan yelled at him, red facing, that's disgusting, blah, 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 blah. So a lot of these libertarians, and they would fight with other scholars who had religious views. It's kind of like that Ayn Rand thing, you know, that being religious is being stupid somehow to their, their point of view because they're so believe themselves so act rational. And so there was a kind of hostility to, um, to religious faith. But even Buchanan from the 1970s started to see that for a mass population that would never believe in libertarianism, that a kind of um, conservative faith would be helpful. He, anyway, he, he talks about that in kind of col colorful terms in some places. And Charles Koch and his network of organizations that he and his fellow donors fund have taken that um, to an extreme in that they know that they can never get to, you know, to the goalpost on their politics by, again, sailing honestly under this libertarian flag. So what they do is work with organizations that incite prejudice to get the base to vote. So in my own state of North Carolina, they wanted to have, they wanted to make it impossible for local communities to pass living wage ordinances or raise municipal wages or benefits what did they do? They packaged that in what you've probably heard about is the bathroom bill. HB2, it was called, and it was saying that trans people, the city of Charlotte had uh, passed an ordinance to protect trans people's right to use the bathroom of, that corresponded to their gender, and these North Carolina affiliates of Coke kindled the homophobia to get people to the polls to support this, um, this bill um, when, in fact, the, the money people behind it were really aiming at wages. Um, and you see that again and again. I'm on the mailing list of these people, so I know they sent out mailings. You know, another Koch-funded organization, uh, Judicial Watch, sent out mailings saying, do you, repeated mailings in the run-up to the 2016 election, do you realize your election is about to be stolen by millions of illegal aliens? Now, anybody who, has ever worked with the undocumented or thinks for a moment will understand that the last thing an undocumented person wants to do is vote, right? <laughs> to get put in the attention of the legal system so that they would be harmed. But these guys are so either so racist <laughs> or so cynical that they will use uh, charges like that, again, to turn people out to vote for this agenda that is packed with all these other things. So it's, uh, 
Yeah, there, as I said, there were times when I really felt nauseated doing this research. It's just like, wow. But again, I take heart from the fact that they know that if a majority knows what they're up to, they could be stopped. Well, we only have about five minutes left, and um, I do have a question here that, that uh, says, please explain Buchanan's economic theory of politics and the concept of political deficits, <laughs> which I think you passed over. Okay, okay, so, uh, yeah, so, so um, Keynesian economics that was popular at mid-century, well, and it's still the dominant, you know, approach of uh, um, economists to uh, <laughs> recessions and depressions argued for pump priming, which today's young people don't get because they've never seen an old style pump. But the idea was that when that capitalism had an inbuilt structural problem, modern capitalism, that it's a cyclical system by nature. So it goes into crisis, into recession or depression. And if you don't have some mechanism to hold up demand, it's going to keep falling. And it's going to be a catastrophe like we saw in the 1930s. So Keynes's genius was to say, have the government step in and, and, and put money into the economy, public works, unemployment insurance, whatever it takes to basically keep demand going until the system can revive. Now Buchanan and the others on the libertarian right did not like Keynesianism uh, at all um, and, and wanted to combat it. And, but what, what Buchanan did with his, um, his approach to politics was to say, if we model these elected officials as in self-interested individuals, as, as you were talking about, um, Alexandra, that then, then we can see that their interest is in getting reelected. And they will therefore make multiple promises to multiple constituencies, not really caring how they run up the bills because they're not going to pay them. It's going to be other people. It's going to be taxpayers who are going to pay that. So his uh, explanation of deficits explained something that the Keynesians couldn't. They didn't. Ex how, how were they going to explain how it, it, governments continued to run deficits in times of prosperity? So that was that was really an original insight. I mean, the empirical stuff was not that well supported, and that his whole school was always criticized for a lot of their empirical work. But it is an interesting thought, and has certainly agitated um, a lot of people politically. So. Well. Um, the, the book signing is in the White Oak Room, if, uh, uh, right after, right following. And please join me in thanking uh, Dr. McLean for this. Thank, Thank you. You're awesome. Thank you for the question. And Dr. Rhodes and Dr. Philander.